All right, hello everyone. Welcome to the Tellit webinar, How to Select a Router for First Responder Applications. I'm Ben Stone, and I'll be your moderator for today's webinar. Joining me today is Ken Bendaz, VP for Application Engineering at Tellit, and Steve Mazur, Director of Government Business Development, Digi International. The First Responder Network is the first cellular broadband network dedicated to public safety. It will enable more reliable communication for first responder and better device interoperability across different agencies. With this new network, first responder vehicles, traffic control, and transit systems can utilize purpose-built onboard cellular mobile access routers as network gateways that securely bridge local subnets to agency systems. So, how do you ensure these routers will meet the requirements for mission-critical communications? Today, we will talk about Apologies there. Today we'll talk about why speed matters and the role of cellular, uh, how to measure reliability, ruggedness, and security in cellular mission critical devices, what to look for in first responder communication solutions. With that, I will give it to Steve Mazur. Thank you, Ben. Uh, and thank you everyone for joining Teled and Digi today and RCR Wireless to discuss public safety broadband communications. Uh, you know, today, really ubiquitous wireless communications is starting to become a reality, and we all have a duty to make it work for our first responders. It will help ensure their safety as they fulfill their mission to protect ours. So, uh, next slide, please. Let's take a look at the agenda. Uh, we'll look at today's challenges and what a solution should look like. Then we'll run through uh, key use cases where cellular routers play an important role. We'll explore the technology behind public safety broadband networks and then how to reduce that into useful specifications. And lastly, we'll take a look into the many cellular module and data card options offered by Telet. Uh, next slide, please. So successful communications is essential to a successful emergency response. You get the opposite with spotty communications and it might actually make the situation worse. I think most would agree that today's networks aren't adequate, that improvement is needed to achieve effective communications. And we all recall an unfortunate event often cited in this use cases, it was the Boston Marathon bombing. According to a DHS uh, case study published four months after the incident, all cellular networks were saturated and non-functional for 90 minutes. Landlines were nearly as bad. Officials were able to get through using GETs, that's the government equivalent, the government emergency telecommunications service and WPS, the wireless priority service. However, the call initiation takes extra steps and time. It was a little awkward, not fast and quick as you normally have on your cell phone. And like any rarely used service, some agency accounts had expired, leading to extra trouble and confusion. Uh, DHS stated in that study that the radio network worked well. Much credit went to the Massachusetts Communications and Interoperability team. They had conducted regular training on the radio systems with the agencies that support the marathon. Later uh, uh, in that incident, the effort, sh effort shifted to apprehending the suspects and other agencies came to assist. Uh, there was some trouble then as they did not have their radios programmed with standard interoperability channels, which led to some trouble. Uh, so, so, so what we've seen is sometimes, you know, sophisticated technology that used in analog and digital trunking systems can compound the issue. And I think everyone would agree that radios work well. They've been the backbone of public safety communications for decades. Uh, the challenge at times is uh, is the complexity, and uh, and looking ahead, it's it's the limitations, right? They're narrow band and medium band. Uh, they can't support some of the the high bandwidth video and imagery that that uh, public safety applications could take advantage of in the future. So uh, next slide, please. So, so what is really needed? What, what is required for effective first responder communications? Fundamentally, uh, the system must be fail safe, low latency, interoperable and secure. In a disaster, right, the communication towers must remain standing, uh, powered and connected to the backbone. The system must always have bandwidth available for first responders. And there cannot be lengthy delays in transmission and reception of the data, either voice or video. And finally, all the communication devices used in the response to an incident must not be blocked. They must be able to communicate with each other and external systems and personnel. 
And so if and only if, right, if and only if that rock solid interoperable network is in place, then public safety services can be layered uh, for effective communications. And for voice services, that means the system must enable push to talk, group call, talker identification, and emergency alerting. These are some of the common capabilities today in the uh, public safety networks uh, on radio. And also uh, uh, what's needed uh, to really uh, improve the, uh, the, the response to incidents is high resolution video and images. And uh, first responders need to be able to send those to individuals or to groups. Also, each responder must be, able, must be able to know the location of other responders, right? That location awareness is key to incident response. And certainly during, uh, during the transition, uh, as, as some of these public safety systems shift over to LTE, these existing radio systems must be interconnected with the systems, future systems as they come online. And, all, all, and one point of all of this, right, is the economies of scale. Uh, uh, these systems uh, uh, should be less expensive. Uh, after all, it's an open system with full competition from equi equipment vendors like Digi and Telet and, uh, and all the network operators. Okay, I see we're going to take a poll. Let's take a minute and uh, uh, everyone, if you don't mind, take a, uh, take a look at those questions and mark your responses. Okay, did you want to move on, Ben, or should we uh, wait further? Yeah, we can just move on. I think it could be helpful to give everyone just a moment as, as you continue through your presentation. Okay, all right. Okay, next slide. Uh, let's take a, take a look at some of the use cases uh, that uh, are, uh, are key to this uh, public safety communications. Uh, one, one use case that uh, isn't so obvious is transit bus and rail. Uh, some large incidents uh, may require evacuation. A mass ex exodus in personal vehicles would be futile in a case, and in any case, many residents of large cities do not own cars. Uh, partly this is due because the, the you know, urban cities are growing, there's the people are moving into the cities, uh, the, there's going to be more density uh, of personnel. Um, and, and one thing that uh, is clear, though, after, after an incident, uh, a best approach usually is not to move, to seek immediate shelter and not venture out. Uh, but of course, events such as the Boston Marathon, there are many visitors that need to find their way out of the city and away from the scene. So uh, transit systems must enact emergency response procedures which require fail-safe communications. And what's happened uh, on these transit systems, uh, due to the advances in network equipment, uh, and services, most all buses now have onboard cellular routers which function as communications gateways. They support uh, a multitude of systems on board. Uh, what a bus has become is really a mobile data center of sorts. So it's quite complicated and sophisticated and technologically advanced uh, mobile platform. So coordination of this bus fleet is, uh, is accomplished uh, through transmission of the location of the bus and through voice communications with central dispatch. Uh, all that is done now uh, through voice communications, uh, uh, through, uh, through, through routers on board the buses. Uh, there are still uh, some radio systems out there as well, but more and more what's happening is the uh, bus agencies are, are putting communication, voice communications through the IP network using voice over IP or even voice over LTE in some newer locations. So therefore, these systems really are mission critical uh, you must be able to uh, access uh, these systems on board the bus, uh, and they need to run on a fail-safe communications network. Uh, next slide. Uh, another uh, interesting uh, uh, use case is traffic management. Right in these uh, larger cities, uh, uh, there are there are often uh, uh, you know uh, it's congested. Uh, there's already traffic uh, challenges in a normal day. Uh, following some incident that could become uh, even more congested, of course, and, and good incident response involves getting first responders 
to the site. So we need to expedite their arrival. This can be done uh, better, of course, with good traffic management, with priority access lanes for, for the responders to get to the site. Also, there are some secondary benefits to those in the area that can be achieved uh, if they're properly notified of the incident uh, using message signs, and, the, and then also traffic flows could be managed such that, uh, tra that they're prioritized to help uh, citizens, citizens and residents avoid the area of the incident. So similar to transit, uh, what's happened in these uh, systems is the intersection controllers, if you notice uh, in an intersection, there's usually a cabinet there, and in that cabinet, there's a cellular router, right? It's uh, No one's running wires anymore, except fiber, of course, but uh, for most intersections, there's a cellular router, and sometimes uh, the cellular communication link is the primary link, right? It's not, not always the backup. Sometimes it's the primary, just because of the cost of running wires. So uh, to make sure that that system runs well in, the, in responding to an incident, you have to provide you know, a fail-safe network for those uh, intersection controllers. So here again, we're looking at uh, uh, running a, on a public safety broadband network for for not personnel, but for the for the city assets, right, that are used in managing the normal uh, systems within the city. Uh, next slide. So this is the classic uh, use case, of course, for a public safety broadband network. It's it's the police car. The police car is really a, a mobile command post. You can see from the, the graphic there that there's uh, quite a number of systems on board a police car. It's, it's a uh, it's a real a small computer room, mobile computer room, and uh, and for the police officer to to uh, provide his services to the to the incident, right? These systems need to be online, right? If he if he were in this uh, police car with no communications, there wouldn't be much help at all. So, again, here on a police car, right, on board, uh, there's a mobile router. That router needs to have priority access to the network, so the so the police officer can have access to, to uh, the command center and also to other officers uh, uh, addressing the incident response. Next slide. Uh, fourth and last use case to highlight today is uh, quite different and it's, uh, it's called CBURN detectors. Uh, CBURN is an acronym for chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear and explosive hazards, right? They were talking about hazards. Uh, there are systems out there today that uh, that have these sensors all packaged into one device. They communicate wirelessly. Uh, those systems are used now today for incident response, uh, uh, both in uh, state and local uh, situations, and then of course uh, DOD, right? And in some cases, uh, so those those the communications from those uh, sensors uh, are often uh, implemented using a wireless technology, and they also need to have priority access to a network. Uh, the technology has advanced significantly with uh, uh, M2M and IoT type uh, services, and, uh, and in this case, it's a very small, typically a, a CAT1 cellular device. CAT1, uh, for those who may not know, it's, uh, it's still LTE. It's just low bandwidth, right? And with low bandwidth, you get low power, so you can have years and years of battery life on a cellular device that's not transmitting a lot of data, which is perfect for that application. Uh, next slide, please. So we're shifting a bit uh, in the discussion here to, uh, you know, what's happening in, in the standards world and why why these uh, why are, why are public safety broadband networks now such an important topic? Um, what's happened is uh, really through the standardization of LTE, uh, which you all have in your cell phones today. I mean, why does your cell phone work on any network operator and around the world? Uh, it's because of a global standards organization called 3GPP it started in the late 90s uh, and with a vision for wireless internet. Uh, 3GPP developed all the standards for LTE and they have started of course on publishing the standards for 5G. Uh, they don't do this uh, in a vacuum, they work with industry associations who are very familiar with uh, certain areas, right, uh, such as rail or, or connected vehicle, uh, and in this case uh, the industry associations were associated with Public safety. Uh, it started about a decade ago with the National Public Safety Telecommunications Council. It's a U.S. organization. Uh, they they uh, decided that uh, the best future for public safety communications was on LTE. Uh, they engaged 3GPP and uh, worked with them through over the years uh, into this decade, uh, trying to establish what the user requirements would be, what are the use cases. And the 3GP committee then took all of that information and started working it into the 
into the protocols and the radios of the uh, LTE network so it could be supported. A, uh, the key requirement uh, for those standards uh, is forward compatibility. And forward compatibility is, a, is an important term. Uh, it's one where uh, what you develop today uh, is a good uh, foundation for features to be added uh, as, as, as the situation evolves, as more capabilities are put into the network. So it's a key requirement of the 3GP, 3GPP committee to make sure that everything built today is forward compatible with what could be built in the future. And, and uh, it's important to you too as, uh, uh, as part of the uh, uh, operator and equipment vendor community uh, and users of this equipment that what you buy uh, in the near future, right, you can be comfortable that it will still be, be supported and be able to provide you with the communications features that may be coming uh, years from now. So, you know, and it's not a new concept, right? This is uh, forward compatibility is a good analogy is, is fiber, right? Think of the fiber under our streets. Uh, much of it is decades old, but it's not being replaced. Uh, the in internet keeps expanding, uh, but underneath, right, we're still transmitting quite a bit of data on these old fibers that's still compatible. Of course, there's greater capacity available with new multi-mode fiber, uh, where the limitations of the old fiber are, are manageable. And uh, one other point, one important point, right? This technology, these LTE and and, and upcoming 5G uh, systems, right? They they uh, provide this mission critical service uh, without dedicated spectrum. Uh, they are designed into the protocols and the low-level mechanisms of of the uh, cellular chipsets, the modules, and the firmware, so that uh, you can have priority and have uh, good service, even though you're running on a shared network, right, with other consumers that are also using the bandwidth. Uh, how that works is that, of course, you get priority. Uh, when there's trouble, uh, then uh, they are knocked off the network, right, or delayed or in some fashion, so that there's always bandwidth for first responders. So so for, for wireless, however, you know, it's not as simple as, as the fiber analogy, right? Uh, wireless is evolving quickly. So uh, let's take a look at, at cellular technology for, for a few minutes, and then we'll take a look at how to specify such technology. So next slide, please. Many of you have uh, seen similar slides. Uh, 3GPP uh, puts out releases, uh, and, uh, and they've been doing that for, uh, for a few decades now. And uh, we all know LTE. Uh, after after LTE became LTE Advanced, so every every six months or so, another standard is released. But every two to three years, uh, uh, TGPP puts out a marketing name with a new capability, a new bundled capability. And first was LTE, and now LTE Advanced, and and we're just now seeing LTE Advanced Pro. Right, uh, systems are just starting to come out now with an even greater capacity uh, and capability. Uh, and then uh, ultimately on the far right is 5G, right? That is, uh, those specifications are being uh, developed now. Some releases have occurred this year. Uh, the last uh, 5G release is scheduled for the end of 2019. Uh, so what happens though is those releases, uh, as they, they are just standards, right? They're specifications, but they've been built through collaboration with equipment vendors and network operators and the standard specialists. So they're fully vetted, they're global, they're, they're, they're going to work for you. Uh, in, in whatever technology you deploy for wireless communications. Uh, but it takes a few years, right? So the standard comes out and then uh, a few years later, you actually start to see uh, the uh, capabilities in your, in your devices. And that's the bottom rows there. You can see the various releases over time. Uh, and then the, uh, if you take a look at the middle of the bottom there, the CAT3, CAT4, CAT6, those are categories, uh, user equipment categories. They indicate a, a family of capabilities in the speed uh, of the uh, communications. So an interesting, uh, if you look at LTE Advanced Pro there, uh, looking at what's in the box, there's some interesting things there that came about, came about right? One, one thing of interest, of course, is the speed, right? We're, we're at the gigabit LTE speeds now with LTE Advanced Pro. That's been a, a major milestone for, uh, for the uh, you know, global communication standards at the gigabit. Um, but also in there, you have uh, license-assisted access, uh, LAA, 
uh, LAA is key because what it does is it allows a a, a cellular uh, link to uh, to exist in various places, right? You have a core uh, thresh, a core a core link on licensed spectrum, but then high bandwidth, uh, uh, whatever you need, quick high bandwidth. Uh, sometimes then that occurs over on unlicensed spectrum, right? So up in the five gigahertz band. Uh, and then also some of the core, well, the earlier public safety specifications came out earlier. Some of the key areas that are more application level in public safety are also an LT advanced pro level of, of releases. Next slide, please. So looking at, uh, you know, this, this advanced uh, sort of uh, phase where we are with LT advanced pro gigabit LTE, uh, it's around the corner just coming out. Uh, how, how is that done, right? It's not done by uh, just uh, amazingly fast uh, modulation and, and spectrum. What it's, what's being done is, is uh, what's called carrier aggregation. That's the first row there. So there's, so there's one RF carrier normally in, in the older days where that would carry uh, modulated data, but now they're just multiplexing more and more carriers. And these carriers, RF carriers, not elevated carriers, but RF carriers can uh, exist in multiple channels across multiple bands and LTE is, is just smart enough to know how to uh, recombine those back at the receiver so it looks like one link to the user. Uh, also on the second row, uh, the modulation is becoming more and more dense, allowing more data and a faster transmission speed. And then there's MIMO, many of you heard of MIMO, uh, we're, we're about to hit 4x4 MIMO on cellular, it's been uh, in place for, for Wi-Fi for some time. Uh, it's a great uh, technology and invention for improving speed and, and resilience in, uh, in rough environments. Uh, and then the fourth way, well, how this is all happening, because uh, spectrum, right? The FCC is just uh, pushing forward more and more spectrum, uh, auctioning it off uh, both to licensed and unlicensed users. Uh, that's been a boon to improving the, the speed of, uh, of, of uh, cellular technologies. Five gigahertz is... Uh, unlicensed band 3.5 gigahertz is uh, uh, is just finishing up uh, its allocations. There'll be some unlicensed there, some licensed. 700 megahertz uh, band 14 uh, became available 20 megahertz uh, recently, and then also uh, 600 megahertz. Right, a huge spectrum band was auctioned off uh, earlier. Uh, next slide, please. So when you look at the releases, right, uh, uh, what what is happening in the uh, 3GPP area that is so important is that they uh, they have put into these four releases the bulk of public safety, and and public safety is really uh, at a basic level it's it's uh, commonly called mission critical services. It's part of a family of protocols and capabilities built into the uh, LTE standards, and it started with release 12 and probably a little earlier. Uh, some of the multicast bearer technologies were built into the into the uh, networks earlier than that, but release 12 was really the first public safety. You have proximity services, group communication, some of the bare basic uh, elements for to be used in, in, in subsequent applications. And release 13, we, uh, mission critical push to talk uh, was, was standardized. Uh, and uh, also group calls, right? So uh, one to many and, uh, and some of those key areas for responding to incidents. Uh, and mission critical data, mission critical video, right? Those are all new features that uh, we all look forward to being able to use on these public safety networks. Uh, they uh, were basically spec'd in in release 14, and release 15 is is uh, is is just about done. I think the majority of it was finished in March, uh, and uh, it's more of an application level. And in this case, there's a lot of internetworking, right? The, the committee is making sure that. Uh, even though, uh, you know, with LTE, uh, as it uh, develops and becomes more prevalent in public safety applications, that there will always be a connection into the radio systems. The radio systems have been a key part of uh, public safety over years, and they certainly will be around for a long time. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so, uh, all that technology, uh, all that work, right, it's being done on a global scale. Uh, we're going to get to be able to take advantage of it, uh, not just in the U.S., right? This is really the public safety broadband networks are going in all over the world based on uh, 3GPP uh, work. Uh, and so how, how do you, as a, uh, as a potential buyer or looking at using uh, 
uh, specking these types of systems, what do you need to think about, right? So in a, in, a, in a router, right, these are some of the core things, right? And what's stated here is public safety band 14, but that's not really just band 14. It's the other bands as well, CBRS, uh, uh, license assisted access, right? Getting access to the, uh, to the unlicensed band for very high bandwidth applications. Uh, probably not really needed at this point for, for applications, but something to look forward to. Uh, and then cybersecurity, that's key, right? It's, uh, you know, as these systems are all wireless, uh, that you have to have that encryption on board. And, and there are really uh, two good ways to make sure you're safe. One is to have a cryptographic coprocessor on board, right? In it, all the uh, cryptographic keys are stored. It's a one-way uh, storage. Uh, and then also, you want to make sure that you have hardware uh, cryptographic processor on board because you cannot uh, do these algorithms on a CPU, right? It's just too CPU intensive. Your your devices will uh, spend a lot of power and time uh, crunching the data and encrypting it. And then there's the regular items, right, that you just have to have in these systems. They have to be vehicle rated. You know, standard 810G is a good example. Uh, SEJ1455, there are a number of them. They have to be compatible with other onboard vehicle systems. There's electromagnetic compatibility to think about. Do you want to be a good neighbor to other electronic devices and then be able to be immune somewhat to those who might not be also that are on board the on board the vehicle so uh, everything works well also remote management is key you cannot have thousands of police cars out there that need to be individually managed there must be a management platform that uh, provides access for firmware loads configuration updates and then monitoring right and just in case uh, some something happens right you want to be able to detect that and react quickly uh, devices should be programmable it's a it's a uh, relatively new trend, but it's been around for a while. But make sure that on board those devices, you can run an application because you cannot be, uh, you have to be adaptable. Uh, new new devices, new systems will come online and, and you can't go back to the manufacturer all the time to look for new firmware loads. You need to have your staff be able to quickly program these devices. And then gigabit ethernet, that's common now. It's it's a uh, core capability. These systems need to have that kind of capability, especially if you have onboard video. You're not going to want to uh, connect to an onboard router with a DVR at 100 uh, megabits per second. That would slow things down. Next slide, please. Now, so key things inside uh, such a device, right? You, you spend a lot of time with all these uh, new protocols, the interfaces for high speed gigabit LTE. What you don't want to do is have, uh, have that. Uh, uh, router or network device slow things down because of the core design. So inside the inside the device, you want to be sure, right? This is part of a topology and it's part of the electronic design that every uh, cellular interface card has its own dedicated bus, high-speed bus linking it to the CPU. If you try to share a bus, then you're going to have contention on the bus, and uh, and that will slow down uh, slow down some of the traffic and the transmissions, especially video, right? You don't want to slow that down. Uh, also, the bands, right, uh, the next uh, bullet there, you want to make sure you have all the LTE bands that are used in the United States, if this is where you operate. I've listed uh, most of them there, except I think I forgot band 71. That should also be on that list. Uh, and then uh, and then user user equipment, right? UE is the uh, 3GP term for the devices, and uh, those categories apply to it. Uh, uh, available today, pretty, pretty common is CAT11, right? So if you're running on a network, uh, uh, that has pretty good bandwidth, right? Then, uh, then that's uh, that's a reasonable uh, and a good speed, good uh, performance. Uh, you can uh, work with that for many, many years. There is uh, looking ahead, right? Cat 18 is is becoming available. Cat 18 gives you more speed, uh, but you can see the carrier aggregation is how Cat 18 is achieved, and and so you really need extra bandwidth. So such thing as band 14 or CBRS or or uh, or you know, five, uh, five gigahertz LAA, you wanna be able to have that extra bandwidth there to take advantage of the carrier aggregation that's present in CAT18 devices. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so, uh, you know, Digi, Digi uh, just a, a quick plug, you know, we are a, we're a communications equipment manufacturer. We're in the IoT and M2M space. We have new line of, of routers that are uh, fast, versatile, uh, they play in a variety of markets, including public safety, of course, and uh, and then also transit transportation. We've highlighted a couple there. Uh, to check out our website if you would like further information. We also manufacture our line of um, wireless devices uh, for embedded systems, uh, as well as some of the traditional network equipment.
Okay, I'd like to hand off to uh, Ken. Great, thanks, Steve. Uh, I'm going to take a few minutes to talk about Tellit, just to give everybody a little background on how we participate in this router gateway business and, and how we have a close partnership with Digi and what we do to help enable some of the Digi products that you just spoke about. Tellit is a, a pioneer in the M10 industry. We've been uh, doing M10 communications since year 2000. And we really focus on being the leading enabler of IoT, of Internet of Things. And so at Tell, we have two main offerings. We have an IoT products offering, which we'll talk a little bit about today with our IoT modules. And we also have an IoT services offering, which includes connectivity and platforms. So on the connectivity side, we were able to uh, get our partners connected through different network operators, uh, network operators like AT&T, uh, Verizon, Sprint, T-Mobile, Rogers, Tele2, Vodafone, whoever it may be. And then on the platform side, we offer uh, a platform, an, an enterprise-grade platform where you can you know, store your data, manipulate your data, and kind of connect your uh, enterprise business, whether it's SAP, Oracle, or other uh, CRM systems directly to the devices and to the edge of the network. And so our main focus at Telet is really about providing building blocks to enable end-to-end -to -end -to -end communications. And our focus is really around enterprise-grade, mission-critical devices that need to be ruggedized. Um, and so, you know, for those reasons, uh, in our heritage and our background, this public safety and first responder market is really a good fit for Tele to participate in. Uh, next slide. So we're going to talk a little bit today about our IoT module offering and how it uh, correlates to public safety first responders and more specifically, specifically into the router and gateway uh, marketplace. And so Tele offers a variety of wireless technologies that can be used inside of uh, pu for public safety first responder devices. We have cellular technologies and, and today we're going to talk a lot about 4G LTE. We have positioning technologies with GPS and multi-constellation like GLONASS, uh, Beidou, um, and Galileo. Uh, we also have uh, other technologies like Wi-Fi and Bluetooth which are great for edge sensors. And so uh, today what we're going to focus on is a lot around LTE and cellular, which is a big focus for Telet. Uh, Telet continues to be a leader when it comes to our cellular module offering. Um, you know, we are typically one of the leaders first to market when it came to voice over LTE or Volte modules. Uh, LTE category one, uh, we're, we're a leader, uh, you know, first CAT 11 product, 600 megabits per second. And then we're gonna be the first to market with a CAT 18 product, like Steve was mentioning, uh, which, which is gigabit LTE. Um, and so we really focus on making designs easier so you can scale your business. And so when it comes to our IoT modules, from a hardware perspective, we have a lot of products in the same form factor. We're going to talk about two different form factors today. One is an industry standard mini PCIe, and the other one is a Telet standard 910 form factor. It allows you to do one hardware design and really scale your business um, into different markets and different network operators. And same thing on the software front. We really focus to have a common software layer, same driver, same commands, so you can write your, one, your, your firmware one time and then deploy it around the world. Uh, next slide. So today I'm gonna to focus on cellular modules that were designed for uh, first responders in the public safety market. Um, these, are the, these are the modules that uh, Digi is using to enable their public safety offering. So some of the products that Steve talked about, the Cat1 uh, sensor, um, you know, is, is, it can be based on LE910, and then some of the gateways and routers can be based on our LM940 or LM960. So I'm going to talk a little bit about these two different offerings that we have. A um, couple key parts here. Steve did a really good job of explaining how 3GPP is really important because 3GPP is a standard base. Some of the public safety offerings in the past have been proprietary and were not scalable. They were not scalable to many different uh, network operators. They weren't scalable for different regions of the world or different countries. And that's all changed with release 12 of 3GPP uh, specification and moving forward. So you can now do a single design, you can have multiple, multiple carrier support, and you can also deploy around the world. It's really gonna help make public safety and first responder uh, ecosystem a lot more robust and, and, and grow a lot faster, which is really good news. When it comes to uh, pre-certification, pre-certification is really one of the main value adds that Telet offers. So what we do is we design a cellular component that's compatible with the different network operators and 3GBP standards. We also go through regulatory, which is FCC and IC, 
certifications, the industri uh, industry certifications with PPCRB and GCF, and then the network operator certification. So we'll take these products through, you know, the AT&T approvals, Verizon, T-Mobile, FirstNet, uh, Rogers Bell Telus in Canada, and also global certifications. So we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Um, can move to the next slide. So what's TELET's concept for public safety? Um, like Steve mentioned, it's bigger than one band, it's bigger than one uh, network operator. And so when we're designing uh, our public safety products, which we'll talk about the LE910 and LM960, uh, they do support band 14, which is extremely important, but they also have other bands that are supported. Um, we have multiple network operators support in single products. So we're trying to really help the ecosystem scale by, by providing options. The option is design once, deploy multiple products in multiple regions to multiple carriers. And then when it comes to uh, technology options, uh, a lot of the cellular modules in the past just supported data. And data is important for a lot of different use cases, but when it comes to first responders, voice is also important. So we have our uh, uh, public safety modules uh, supporting Volti, which is voice over LT, so you get data and voice support. You also, you also get the SMS text messaging support. And then also very important is GPS or location support. We have built-in GPS and assisted GPS location support. It's very important as you're trying to locate uh, where events are happening, where the first responders are, to kind of make sure you can route uh, things in the, in the most optimized way. And same thing with data speeds. There's certain types of devices like we talked about today that require mobile broadband. The routers and gateways are going to require CAD 18 products with five carrier aggregation channels, which we'll talk about. Um, so those can deliver, you know, downlink speeds of 1.2 gigabits per second. We also have the lower end um, entry level products with our LE910 CAT1 products, which are much lower data speeds, five megabits per second up and 10 down, which are great for edge devices like sensors um, uh, and certain types of uh, noise detection systems. And, and we'll talk about that a little bit later too. And then as far as form factors, we mentioned there's two different form factors. One is an embedded form factor, which really gives you the lowest uh, uh, or smallest size, um, reduces uh, power consumption too and cost because it's really focused on reduction of size, cost, power. And then you have the mini PCE industry standard, which is really based for mobile broadband high data speeds. Okay, you can go to the next slide. So just a, a one quick minute on these, these uh, components which are helping enable public safety and helping enable uh, the Digi offering. Um, you know, we're ba these are basically cell phones, but they're cell phones with no keypad, no display, they're component. Um, they can still do the data, voice, and text messaging like we talked about. And I've shown a block diagram here of what it takes to kind of bring a product to market. Um, you need antennas for the frequency bands you're gonna support. Um, you need some ability to turn on and off the cellular radio, just like a cell phone. You need a power supply, whether it's uh, a battery operated or if it's uh, you know uh, wired. Uh, you need your UICC SIM connections based on the different network operator you're going to use. So we, we could accept any type of SIM form factor or any type of SIM uh, from a network operator around the world. Um, there's options for audio connections and, and general purpose IOs, and then also an application processor, which is really important. Um, an application processor would be the the brains that's running your uh, application or device sending instructions to the telet cellular module to tell what to do. Do you need to make a voice call? Do you need to answer a voice call? Do you need to send data? Where do you need to send the data to? So our device is really about being compliant with the industry standards and the network operator standards, and then we let you control the device to meet your needs. Okay, we can go to the next slide. Okay, I'm gonna talk uh, about two, two products today. The first product is our LE910C1NF product. This is an embedded module, so it solders directly down to the PCB. It's 28 by 28 millimeters. And this product supports seven LT bands with 3G fallback. So this is a great product to use for an edge device. Um, this, this product would be great for North American deployments. We have data and voice support, and we also have the location technology that we talked about with GPS and GNSS, which is multi-constellation. So it'll get you coverage not only with uh, the GPS satellites, but other uh, satellites that are in the sky to kind of improve the first time of fix or location um, positioning in different use cases. Uh, we have extended temperature range, which is also important. You know, we're trying to make very ruggedized products. You know, our, our, our focus again is around mission critical enterprise grade. 
Um, and, and in order to do that, we need to have extended temperature range, which means we select components that are above and beyond the standard um, commercial specifications. You know, the cell phones are not rated minus 40 to plus 85. We're trying to have a very ruggedized, very hardened product out in the marketplace. We also support uh, device management. Uh, Steve talked about how important device management is as you get you know, uh, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of devices in the field. We support firmware over there upgrading. Um, so we have these different capabilities that are brought to you by standards from OMA DM or lightweight M2M. We have cloud support for the leading cloud providers uh, like Microsoft and, and AWS. And then one of the most important things is the pre-approvals. By having these pre-approvals, we really help reduce the investment that one of our partners needs to make in order to get to market. So we really focus about, uh, by us doing the pre-certification, some of the heavy lifting, it allows our partners to focus on designing their router boxes, uh, reducing their time to market, reducing their risk, reducing their investment they need to make to bring a product to market. Okay, we can go to the next slide. The LM960 is, 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 uh, is a new product we're launching this year, and this is the first gigabit LT product. Um, this is an LT category 18 product, which will support 1.2 gigabits download and, and 150 megabits upload. And that upload speed is really important. Uh, we are supporting two X carrier aggregation, but it does not have to be continuous. So not all two X carrier aggregation is the same. Uh, you won't find uh, 40 megahertz of continuous spectrum anywhere in the U.S., so you need to be able to support non-continuous uh, carrier aggregation uplink, and we do do that. So with this product, you will be able to truly get 150 megabits per second um, and not have a product that is 150 megabits per second but really only supports 75 megabits per second in the real world. Um, it also supports LTE in 22 different bands, so it's a true global product. So it allows you to scale your business and deploy with network operators around the world. Um, by supporting all the required LT bands to get you everywhere from uh, uh, Europe, uh, APAC, and through the Americas. Uh, same thing here, it's a hardened product with uh, you know, extended temperature range, uh, um, data support, GPS support, very similar to what we talked about in the last slide. So this type of product is really focused on the router and gateway. Um, laptop, rugged ads, laptops, uh, you know, Steve talked about how inside certain vehicles like police cars, they need to have a whole ecosystem working together. And nowadays you see most first responders with a laptop or some kind of computer system. So this would be a perfect product for those type of devices. Okay, we can go to the next slide. So, you know, what kind of devices does TeleHelp enable? You know, again, we're an enabler. We are not providing any end-to-end -end solutions. We're trying to help enable end-to-end -end solutions. And today we really focus around our IoT modules and specifically around cellular technology. Um, we talked a lot about, uh, you know, the different gateways and routers and the different use cases around them. But I wanted to point out uh, a, a couple other ways that public safety and first responders can use our technology. And that's really around uh, sensors, I, I think, I'm really intrigued about what we're doing with sensors, whether it's um, sound sensors or, or visual detection or whatever it may be. But uh, with sound sensors, we can detect gunshots, we can detect car accidents, we can detect somebody breaking the window, we can detect spray paint. So it's really amazing what we can do now with sound detection. And I think the key for the whole ecosystem is rather than people reporting a bombing, reporting an accident, reporting a break in, we need to report that real time. And if we can reduce the first uh, uh, the time, the first response, then we're really doing uh, uh, the world a big justice. And so, you know, I really like how uh, the LTE or LE910 product from Talent really fits well in the edge sensor devices um, and it can really help improve uh, the first response time in the future. Okay, that, that's all I have for today. Back to you, Ben. Okay, great. Thank you so much, uh, both Steve and Ken, for your time. Uh, I'm going to open it up to some questions. First, I'd like to start with that poll we asked at the beginning. Just kind of go over that quick and uh, get uh, both Steve and Ken, love to get your thoughts really quick on the, the response from the audience. So let's do number one. Is your company designing devices for any of the U.S. mobile first responder networks, including Band 14? So I see about half of our responders said no. And then we had a close second at, we have cellular first responder products market and we are evaluating vendors for a product or products. 
Um, and then the second question, are you responsible for purchasing products to be used on any of the US mobile first responder networks, including band 14? Similar again, 69% um, said no. And then after that we had, um, I have started looking for first responder product vendors. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? Well, I can start real quick, Ben. I think, I think the big thing here is that uh, this is a new, this is new technology, the 3GPP in public safety. Um, and so this is what I would expect. This is the reason for the webinar today to kind of educate um, the ecosystem and the marketplace on what's becoming available. And so I think if we took this poll three or six months from now, it would change greatly. Awesome. And Steve? Yeah, I agree with Ken. It seems uh, you would always hope for more, right, engaged and starting, but uh, uh, it's really new, right? It's it's the beginnings of a, a new capability with all the mission control services and uh, and time. I think uh, we'll see quite a, quite a few uses of it, not just in public safety, but in other applications as well. Some mission critical business projects as well as rail. So it, it's uh, it's just starting. Okay, great. A uh, question from the audience. Um, the, the, my understanding is AT&T is using band 14 for their commercial network as well. Do you know if this is true? Uh, yeah, I can take that. Yeah, AT&T um, is, is partnered with FirstNet and, and they're using band 14 in different ways. And so, you, you know, AT&T has some uh, uh, information on the website and actually how they're using that band. And Steve, do you have any insight on that? So I read the same that they plan to put uh, 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 regular users as well in band 14, uh, but you'd have to ask AT&T, you know, I, I don't uh, represent them. So it'd be good to talk to them, but even if they did, right, I think it's fine. Well, as I mentioned earlier, the, the protocols, uh, both on, and the uh, firmware are, uh, are built, right, to be able to uh, work on shared spectrum. So it doesn't really matter. Uh, once there's an incident, uh, those uh, select users, right, uh, which which would be some small subset of the overall population in the band, are going to get priority access, and everyone else won't. They'll be their, their radios will automatically back off, and whatever they may be needing to send, if they don't have priority, then it will stay queued in their cellular device until the network has uh, enough bandwidth to service them. Great, thanks both of you. Um, how long does it take to design, test, and certify a product for use in a mobile network environment like Band 14 or similar network? Yeah, I, I can start with that one, Ben. Um, if, you use a, you know, if you don't use a pre-certified module, if you would try to use a chipset, you could be getting into a two-year two effort. With using a pre-certified module, it really shortens that design cycle. Typical design cycle is typically six to nine months. Uh, what we'll do at Teller is we'll try to work with you to understand your needs, make sure that we're architecting the product design to meet the antenna requirements. Uh, we provide design reviews, both Gerber and Schematic, to try to you know, reduce risk and get you to market in those six to nine months. Awesome. And, and uh, again, Ken, does your company offer support for designers and OEMs to integrate end products based on your modules? Yes, that's what we do is, is being vice president of our application engineering team. Um, I have a few different roles and responsibilities. One, one of them is network operator certifications. And then secondly, is product selection and product integration support. So my team, I have hardware and firmware and antenna people that will help customers through the design cycle. Great. And smartphone and tablet manufacturers spend millions to get a product certified to operate with mobile networks. Should we expect similar costs for getting a product to market using digi routers, Steve? So, uh, we take advantage, right, of what Telet uh, produces. Uh, we build the rest of the router, but we uh, uh, and we and we've been doing it for thirty years. Uh, so there's a lot of heritage there. It doesn't take us long to uh, build a new product. Some of the new products I showed earlier are. Uh, really uh, we're under a year, right, uh, to get those products to market. Uh, but uh, uh, taking advantage of the Telet modules really helps speed our development. 
Thank you. And, and do you have other partners that are already integrating solutions for other application areas, such as cameras and so on, that we would work with to get uh, to market faster with solutions for the first responder market? Well, so uh, we, we provide that communications gateway, right? And in this case, mostly in the public safety market, uh, there's all sorts of connections that are made uh, on a bus, on a rail car, in a, in a traffic cabinet. Uh, and uh, often it's any IP-based device, right? It's, it's uh, we make sure, right, that things can get routed to and from it, that there's security, the firewall, all of that, so they're protected uh, behind that, uh, behind the device. Uh, and uh, anything that's an IP device, it's pretty fast, right, in getting in, in, uh, on the network and integrated into, a, into the system. Awesome. How do your modules handle the transition to 5G when the networks start deploying the service? That's for you, Ken. Yeah, um, so uh, the product we're launching this year is Ken 18 product with the LT speeds. The next product after that would most likely be a 5G product within the next couple of years. So we are working uh, closely with the 5G uh, standards body and, and ecosystem of suppliers of components to understand when the products can be ready. But I'm guessing within two years we'll be moving forward with 5G offering. Great. And here's a question from the audience. Are the modules compliant to any MIL STD specs for military use? We, a lot of those are um, end product specifications, so we can provide mm -hmm. some supporting data to help that be achieved on the end product. Yeah, and let me add to that. So that is what we do with our products, uh, the, the shock and vibe and environmental uh, ratings in MIL standard A10G are part of our data sheets. We test to that uh, and make sure we can withstand anything in those, in those specifications. Great. Um, and you mentioned voice support over um, the Volti in the category one for modules. Um, what's Volti, O-L-T-E, and how complex is it to design devices supporting voice for first responders? Okay, yeah. Um, I, I can start with that one. So basically what's, what's really unique about 4G LTE is an all IP based network. In the past, when we talked about 2G or 3G, there was a circuit switch component for voice and there was an IP component for data only. What changed with 4G LTE was everything was IP based. So voice over LTE is an IP based voice technology um, with quality of service to ensure that voice gets priority over data. Uh, works very well, you get HD quality voice. Um, and to use and design around voice is very easy. There are some simple commands that you do to dial a phone number, to, uh, to do uh, call join for three-way calling, to hang up calls, to answer calls. So it's a very simple set of instructions to make those. So it's, it's, it's little integration on the firmware side. Um, on the hardware side, you have to put a microphone and speaker on, so there's a little bit of work there, optimization depending on your form factor, but that, those are all areas that Telet helps with. Oh, great, thank you. In the future, how will cellular networks stay up when faced with overwhelming demand, such as during the Boston Marathon bombing? Sir, I can address that. I did a bit earlier, but uh, what happens in the network is uh, only those users with priority are allowed to transmit, and uh, the network, uh, uh, those new protocols that are that are going in now, and uh, some are already in place, of course, but they just force a back off right onto every other device, such that whatever they might be thinking to do, they cannot. They are told to remain quiet. They don't even transmit, right? And that keeps the RF energy off the network. The um, uh, the benefit of that is, you know, when you have a, a sort of a managed throughput uh, providing data, uh, providing access to a, a limited number of users, right, and the new network doesn't saturate, right, when the network saturates, the throughput just drops down to, to a very low level and no one gets service. So it's the worst situation. So in this, this situation, when there is an incident, those select users will be able to get to the network. They'll have good performance, good throughput, and then whatever is remaining, right, will be used for non-priority users. Okay, great. 
when do you expect 5G to become available? Uh, so speaking from, from Digi's perspective, you know, the specifications aren't finished. Uh, they started uh, to be released. There was one last December. There's three more. The last one is in 2019. So you'll see some products coming out uh, next year, I suppose, on 5G. There'll be limited functionality. They might be point-to-point. -point. They're not going to be general purpose 5G. It's probably it's uh, probably a couple years from now, I think. I mean, uh, Ken, do you see it that way? Yes. Yes, Steve, I, I agree with you. Yeah. And just adding to that, right, 5G isn't, uh, you know, it's a different air interface, right? It's called New Radio, but uh, all the towers uh, that are up now, of course, support LTE, and they will for many, many, many years. So LTE has been a groundbreaking cellular technology, and uh, many of the IoT and, uh, uh, you know, machine-to-machine um, -machine protocols, and, uh, of course, all the phones we have today, all of that is going to stay up and operational for many, many years. I, I couldn't say when, but... Uh, there's there's just a huge uh, base of users out there on LTE. Awesome, thanks you both. Uh, and to that end, uh, what about IoT? Does it play a part in the future pub, uh, public safety applications? Yeah, absolutely. I think I showed that Seaburn uh, example, but uh, uh, it's going to grow and grow, right? And uh, some other examples I can mention, right, for gunshot detectors and other things, but. Um, uh, with 5G, right, uh, there there will come device-to-device uh, -device, uh, communications, uh, some more capabilities. But even before then, right, as you can imagine, police responding to an incident where they'd like like to interrogate the building management system, right? That's a machine-to-machine -machine, uh, type application, and also uh, critical infrastructure. There's plenty of sites around uh, at least the United States that need to be monitored. Uh, th those sites cannot uh, have uh, spotty communications, they must be on some sort of mission critical uh, application. So they're also an IoT based uh, application. All right, thank you so much. Uh, so, uh, one last question, and then we can open it up to the audience as well. Again, um, could the key features identified for public safety networks be delayed for another decade? Yeah, so that comes up, right? Where, where you know, as, as uh, some of these networks have have uh, come out of standards organizations and started to be implemented, uh, uh, folks wonder, right? Uh, you know, is this going to continue, right? Are we going to get to see the benefits of all of this technology and and devices and systems uh, deployed in the years to come? And and at this point, it's inevitable, right? It's happening. It's been going on for years in the standards committee. The whole uh, equipment vendor community and network operating community is behind it. Uh, that I mentioned, uh, you know, that public safety is just one uh, slice of a solution, right? That that is part of what's called mission critical services. That's in the standards now. So uh, there's even a railway specification that uh, uh, application that's running on mission critical services. So so there will be interoperability on on positive train control, right, through cellular networks. And look at connected vehicle, right? There's a vehicle to interchange. Inter uh, vehicle to uh, uh, infrastructure, that's all mission critical. So it's there now, it's gonna happen. Uh, it's just a matter of time. Great, and uh, Ken, would you maybe provide just some closing statements on that as well? Sure, yeah, uh, you know, I, I don't think I have much to add, you know, beyond what, what, what Steve said, but uh, uh, the ecosystem is gonna continue to grow. Um, it's really focused around more edge devices that can interact, um, you know, like we talked about the sensors. I, I think overall, uh, you know, where we're going to be in, in three to four years from now will show that, you know, it's not going to take 10 years. I, I think we're going to make a lot of progress in the next, you know, 24 to 36 months. So, if you know, if we're talking again in a couple of years, it's going to be a, 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 a huge ecosystem and uh, we'll be taking the world in a better place. Great. Uh, well, that concludes the webinar today. Uh, thank you both so much, uh, Steve and Ken. I uh, really appreciate your time today. And thank you again to the audience as well. Take care. Thank you, everyone.